Welcome everyone to today's program. A very happy International Day of Peace to all of you. I am Shireen and I welcome you all from Peace Vigil. Peace Vigil works on peace education. We create practical tools to dismantle hate and bigotry. We are delighted that you have joined us today in our special event to commemorate the International Day of Peace. The International Day of Peace was established in 1981 by the United Nations General Assembly. Two decades later, in 2001, the General Assembly unanimously voted to designate the day as a period of nonviolence and ceasefire. It is important to remember that the United Nations was founded in 1945 after the Second World War, and the main reason it was formed was to prevent future wars and make the world more peaceful. Unfortunately, the most powerful nations in the United Nations have continued to engage in wars, what is even more disturbing is that they have been able to provide justifications to go into wars that have almost always been proved wrong and misleading later on. In such a scenario, and with so many violent conflicts ongoing in the world, it is necessary that we as a peace education organization study those who have devoted their life to understanding the subject of peace. The most illustrious name in that field is undoubtedly Johann Galton, who is widely considered the principal founder of the discipline of peace and conflict studies. Galton first conceptualized peace building by calling for systems that would create sustainable peace. He explained, that we needed to address the root cause of conflict and support local capacity for peace management and conflict resolution. Today, we will be looking at what Galton thought about the US military role in Afghanistan and whether we can learn from his analysis as people who want a more peaceful world. The images coming from Afghanistan in the last few weeks are painful to say the least. A war that lasted 20 years has brought the world nothing but more death and trauma. We hope that today's presentation helps you understand better the situation in Afghanistan and that it makes you better equipped to protect and defend peace in the world in whatever capacity you are able to do. I will now ask Peace Vigil volunteer Mayank if he's there. He was having some internet issues. Mayank, if you are there, please uh, just let it be known in the chat. I think he's there. Um, I now ask Peace Vigil volunteer Mayank if his internet is working all right to introduce our speaker, Samir Dosani. Mayank has just graduated from high school and is a passionate student of history. He has been attending peace vigil programs and has shown keen interest in learning about issues of justice and promoting a better world for all. Mayank, if your uh, internet is working and letting you speak, please go ahead. Okay, am I audible? Yes, you're audible, but unfortunately, uh, because we didn't see you in time, I'm not sure if we can turn your video on, but please go ahead and speak. Okay, thank you, Shirin Didi. Uh, hello, everyone, I'm Mayank, and uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, uh, Peace Vigil Coordinator, uh, Mr. Samir Dosani. Uh, Samir Dosani has been part of movements for global economic justice for more than 25 years. He headed 50 Years is Enough, U.S. Network for Global Economic Justice, Washington, D.C., and the NGO Forum on the Asian Development Bank, Manila. He worked for Amnesty, Action Aid, and Oxfam International for over 10 years. 
Samir holds degrees in religious studies and philosophy from McGill University, Canada, a master's degree in women's study from La Trobe University, Australia, and is currently completing his PhD in anthropology at the University of Western Cape, South Africa. We hope that you will find Samir's presentation today useful in understanding the situation in Afghanistan from a peace perspective. As always, uh, we encourage you to join our trainings and workshop, which happen every month, uh, where we go into details of what each of us individually can do to protect and promote peace. You can reach us at info at the rate peacevigil.net. Over to you, Samir Bhai. Thank you so much, Mayank, for that very kind uh, introduction. Um, I will just begin with my presentation. So uh, as Shidi has said, today is the International Day of Peace, um, and it's been celebrated since the 1980s, 1981 it came about. Um, so clearly it's to do with the Cold War. Uh, I'll also just mention briefly that the, the date was changed uh, after the September 11th attacks uh, to be the 21st uh, of September. So perhaps it's uh, fitting that we're having this discussion uh, now. Uh, <clears throat> As Shidi has said, Johann Galtung is one of the foremost theoreticians of what we call peace studies. Um, he's known as the founding father of the discipline. Uh, and I would like to just go over one of his key concepts. Uh, we'll return to this at the end of the talk, but I'd like you to keep it in mind right now. So when one has a war, right? So we can talk about war between the US and the Taliban in the current situation. There are really four outcomes that generally happen. So he studied many, many wars to, to come up with this theory. The first outcome is that uh, A defeats B, right? So U.S. defeats Taliban, for example. The second outcome is that uh, Taliban defeats uh, U.S., so B defeats A. The third possible outcome, whoops, 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 whoops. Uh, the third possible outcome is that there basically is not an end to war. So there's no, um, there's no resolution in which either A or B feels like it's, it's the right time to end the conflict. So the conflict basically keeps on going. And the fourth is some kind of a confused compromise, which neither A nor B are happy with. And what Galton pointed out, he wrote this stuff mostly in the 1960s. What he pointed out is that all four of these are unsatisfactory. All four of these will just lead to more conflict, right? So instead of these four options, Galtung advocated for a fifth option, which can generally be reached only through mediation, and which he calls a win-win. Now, win-win is something that is so cliched, right? It's used in business talk, it's used in governments, uh, but it's important to remember that it was sort of a new term that he was using in the 1950s and 1960s. Um, so what, what, how we use it today is not how he, he was using it then, and it's not, not what he means. What he means by a win-win is both parties must walk away feeling as though they have achieved what they set out to achieve, or they, they've achieved at least enough to declare a kind of victory without necessarily making the other person or the other party at fault, right? So my win does not necessarily imply your loss. I've won. That's okay. That's, that's fine with me. I'm not interested in continuing the conflict, right? Another key part uh, of understanding Galtung's theories, and this also we'll get to again later, is that actions speak louder than words, right? So we'll talk soon about the conflict triangle. The bit of the triangle that's sort of the most important is actually the actions. Actions will always trump the words. So if the US, for example, says that it is interested in democracy and peace, but it acts in a way so as to support autocratic dictators, for example, in Saudi Arabia, or to support neo-colonial regimes, for example, in Israel, the latter, those actions, is what counts, right? Actions will always count more than words. Okay. So this is a, a map of Afghanistan, as you can see. At the top left there is the, the trade routes. So um, just keep in mind Galtung's theories as we talk about Afghanistan. We're going to talk a bit about the history. Um, Afghanistan was not a country. So you see the map on the left has all the modern countries. Remember, remember that those countries didn't exist until the modern period, till the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, and in the immediate period, so in the case of Afghanistan, the modern borders of Afghanistan 
only began to exist about 1747. In the period prior to 1747, Afghanistan had been part of the Persian Empire, the Safavid Empire, and it had been part of a great many empires before that, right? It is located in a very important and strategic place between ancient Persia and ancient China, right? And then in the later period, closer to the modern period, it was the seat of uh, Muslim civilization. It was one of the seats of Muslim civilization, right? So uh, the map, as you'll see, the map, especially at the top, is showing that Afghanistan was a key stopover on the Silk Roads, connecting China with West Asia and then on with Europe. And it has been playing something like this role since the time of Cyrus the Great, right? Meaning at least 500 BC, meaning more than 2,000 years, 2,500 years now, more than 2,000 years, even at the period that we're going to talk about of the first British invasion. Uh, that's the history. And the little red dots in the map below, those are where we have found archaeological evidence of Silk Road related sort of artifacts, right? So it was all through many different parts of Afghanistan had these kind of uh, markets that were getting goods from both from the China side and from the Europe side, okay? So that said, in, uh, in the middle of the 19th century, right? So we're talking about um, <clears throat> 1839, we have the first British invasion of Afghanistan. This is sometimes called the Anglo, the first Anglo-Afghan war, but that term I don't like to use because it implies a kind of parity, right? If I'm talking about, I don't know, a French-German war, means France and Germany are more or less equal and they're fighting with each other. That was not the case here. This was a colonial invasion uh, that was partially justified by a British fear of the Russians, right? Uh, we don't need to go over the whole history now. We'll, we'll get to it a little bit later. Um, but starting in 1839, from an Afghan point of view, Afghanistan was part of European war games, right? These are both European par powers. So Russia was conquering Central Asia. Um, Britain was, of course, uh, already in, um, in India and soon would be fighting the first um, Indian War of Independence, would fight in it, we'd fighting against indigenous forces, right? So from people who have listened to our previous webinars and are familiar with the 1857 so-called mutiny or first war of independence, Many of the techniques, many of the crimes that the British uh, are going to sort of use in India, they start those here in Afghanistan. That includes, for example, uh, shooting people out of cannons. It includes, uh, you know, different ways of destroying the forest that were used uh, outside of Delhi and so on. They were, they were pioneered here in Afghanistan. Um, so how did the British do this? The British uh, assisted, so I should just say before we get that, again, going back to Galtung, uh, from um, an Afghan point of view, these are two European Christian powers, right? So Russia is Orthodox Christian, um, Britain is Catholic or Protestant, depending, depending on how you define uh, the Anglican Church. And they are fighting, you know, in a Muslim majority country. Of course, it's a diverse country, um, but they're fighting for something that has very little to do with the, the people who are being occupied, right? Uh, yeah, so the, the, the Russians will, of course, come into the story a bit later. So at the moment, it's really just the British who are invading. Um, so there was a, a king who was deposed about 20 years before 18, the 1839 invasion. His name was Shah Shuja. Um, and he, uh, he had a habit of cutting off the ears and limbs of his servants if they displeased him in the slightest. Uh, one European writer says that uh, not a single person in Shah Shuja, Shuja's court seemed possessed of a tongue. Charming fellow. He cut off the tongues of all of his courtiers. And he is the one uh, who the British say, so the British use him as a pretext. They say they're going to restore him to the throne. And they say that they are just uh, there to assist him. That's what they claim. Okay. Uh, of course, that's not really what happens. Uh, what they really do is they invade Afghanistan for the first time. Not for the last time. So this is the first Anglo-Afghan war. There will be a second and there will be a third Anglo-Afghan war. Okay. Um, I don't have time to, and it's not necessary to go over the full events of the invasion of the next one, um, but a few things are important to mention. The first, as I, as I said, is that uh, the reasons for invasing, invading have more to do with British paranoia than anything real, right? The British think they're protecting India from some future Russian invasion, um, but the Russians themselves, if you read the literature from that time, and even literature that the British would have been aware of, so the official statements coming from Russian ambassadors and so on, the Russians have no interest in India at all, right? 
Russians at the time are finding it difficult just to sort of maintain control of Central Asia. So uh, the Russian pretext is silly. And indeed, you know, while the invasion is going on, so I, I, I'll get the year wrong, I believe it's, 17, I believe it's 1841, uh, Britain and Russia will ally with the Ottoman Empire against France and Egypt, right? So there'll be another war in, in Africa and, uh, and what is West Asia where Britain and Russia will be our allies. But of course, that doesn't, that just the fact that they're allying with, with Russia doesn't cause them to pull out of Afghanistan, right? So the alliance happens, the occupation is still going, the British still remain in there. The second thing to say is that the Afghan people very quickly see through the ruse that Shah Shuja is their king, right? So one of the uh, hallmarks of this particular invasion is that the British people really abuse women. Uh, there's all kinds of rapes, there's all kinds of looting. And one of the things that they do is they, uh, quote unquote, steal uh, the wives, the sisters, uh, the daughters of their own allies, right? And so when they, when they do that and the, the men complain to the king, um, the king basically throws up his hands and says nothing. In fact, there's one very lovely quote where, where someone t says uh, to, Shah, to Shah Shuja, the, 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 the Afghan king who's been put in place by the British, he says, if they're in control, meaning the British, if the British are in control, what is the point of you? And if you are in control, what is the point of them? <laughs> so someone, someone has to leave here is what he's saying. Of course, neither of them leave. Um, uh, and by the way, I'll just say that, that one of the th people point to this as a possible place of origin for the tradition of so-called parda and so on in Afghanistan. That didn't exist prior to this period at all. And it's thought that because uh, the British were abusing Afghan women in this way, that may have been one of the things that led for a much more conservative approach to gender relations. This is a theory. Uh, I, I, I don't know enough to weigh on it, in on it, frankly. Many others will say, look, it's later when you have Saudi influence and so on. That's really the real issue. Um, the third thing to say is that the British really like Afghanistan. <laughs> so the weather's nice. They, they, if you read the diaries, there's a lot of talk about the food. So in India, you know, there's uh, food taboos. You can't get meat, you can't get beef and so on. In Afghanistan, they can just go on the, on the street and get uh, kebabs. Of course, I've mentioned um, the women, they like the women. And the weather was nice. So what you'd also found, found is that um, the wives of the officers are hearing stories about um, their men misbehaving. And so the wives of the officers turn up in Kabul um, and they like the weather too and they want to stay there, right? Uh, as I mentioned, um, gender relations are not what they are today uh, in Afghanistan. And women were also fighting uh, in many of these wars. So one vengeful widow uh, very nearly defeated the British in a famous battle in, in this war as well. Uh, anyway, because for a variety of reasons, including um, the fact that they're they just so unpopular, the British um, get thrown out in 1842. There's kind of a, a humiliating walk uh, from uh, Kabul to Jalalabad. Um, and there are soldiers, there are sort of captains who sort of, um, you know, are taking off, um, who are killing members of the British as they retreat. Um, and this painting, as well as there's a more famous painting that I didn't put in here, but you can easily find it, of, um, of one solitary British soldier on a horse entering Jalalabad. Um, so there was a kind of a humiliation, but that was really played up. It was played up at the time and it was played up again, you know, 30 or 40 years later at the time of the second Anglo-Afghan war as part of the propaganda effort. Um, and what did the propaganda say? The propaganda said it was such a brutal um, retreat. So I should say at one point, the women and children, only the English women and children, by the way, only the white uh, people, um, they were sort of, they, they surrendered. So they were sort of taken somewhere they were safe and they, most of them made it back to England safe. In fact, there's one very famous uh, account by one of the women who, who made it safely back to Britain. Um, but the men didn't surrender and they sort of pulled back to Jalalabad. And according to, even now, if you look on the internet, you'll find many, many people saying there's only one person who survived to make it to Jalalabad. That, of course, is not true. Um, there were, you know, I don't know how many survived, but it wasn't one. It was at least a few hundred out of a few thousand, right? Um, so this one sort of solitary British soldier returning uh, forms a kind of a myth, a kind of a folklore for the British, British to raise immediately. This isn't, until, this isn't about the second war. This is still in the same war. They raise what they call an army of retribution or an army of revenge, right? 
So you can tell in the name, they have no interest in reconquering Afghanistan. Rather, they just want to teach the Afghans a lesson. Okay. And here there's a few um, quotes from, from British writers. So one British writer says, quote, Our way of destroying the country is very simple, merely cutting a ring through the bark of every tree. This ruins the country completely, as the trees die directly and the inhabitants live principally on dried fruit and flour made from the dried mulberry. So they're starving the population. Uh, another writer writes on the siege of Kabul. Uh, this is the war of retribution. This is after they had occupied Kabul when they'd been forced to retreat. Then they raised another army. He says, all day the sack went on and great booty did the captors get. Rich dresses, shawls, carpets, silks, horse trappings, arms, emblazoned Qurans, etc. Another says, every house was destroyed. Every tree barked or cut down. Barked means they cut a ring around the tree so it would die. After which the detachment, having collected a considerable spoil of bullocks, sheep, and goats, marched back to camp. Okay, so they're looting and plundering. They're not even trying to do anything else. Uh, a writer called Roebuck says, Ghazni, Kabul, Istalif, and Jalalabad have shared a common doom. Havoc and desolation have marked the path of our conquered armies, and as fellow revenge has been inflicted on our foes as the warmest advocate of retaliation could desire. All right. So they kill, they loot, and they destroy the ancient city of Ghazni, which until that time, so until the 19th century, uh, Ghazni had been one of the most important cities in the ancient world. It had been founded by Cyrus the Great more than 2,000 years before that. It was leveled to the ground completely. Um, and when they, when they leave, when after uh, Shah Shuja is assassinated in 1842, uh, the British install a 12-year-old boy on the throne. Um, and one writer says that it will take decades, perhaps centuries, for Afghanistan to recover from what the British have done in five years. Okay? So remember, this is only, you know, this is less than two centuries ago that we're talking about. And there's going to be other subsequent wars. <laughs> and that war alone, one, writer, one British writer, he's not sympathetic to the Afghans, is saying that it will take them a number of centuries to recover from this. Okay, so... I think it's important to, <clears throat> to spend a bit of time on that first intervention, but I'm not going to spend too much time on the second and third so-called Anglo-Afghan wars. Um, the pattern sort of repeats itself in the, in the second war, especially the third one is a little bit more complicated and we'll get into sort of the modern era in just a minute. Um, the third war, so the second war takes place about 1870 to 1880. The third war takes place um, in 1919. So it's just at the end of World War I. Um, so again, to get back to, to Galtung's framework, you know, if you are an Afghan citizen, what have you learned from the 19th century, from these experiences about the British and by extension about the Europeans, right? They've lied, right? They lied and they invaded under false pretexts. They are lechers, right? They steal women. They, 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 they have no scruples, no morals, right? They fire people out of cannons. Uh, they destroy uh, food supplies, right? They support the most brutal and sadistic of your own kings, right? Kings who couldn't get any domestic support. They support them. The list goes on and on. Um, so, yeah. So in the Third Anglo-Afghan War especially, um, the Afghan government can see that the British are up to something and they actually invade preemptively. They, they uh, attack... The, the border fort in what is today Pakistan. That war ends uh, in, in, without anyone being very happy with the ending. Okay. Um, so just a bit about the modern period. So the modern period is basically a battle between reformers such as Amanullah Khan and uh, Muhammad Sadar Daoud Khan on the one side. So this is Amanullah Khan. Um, so you have the reformers on the one side and you have the so-called traditionalists on the others. Uh, and interestingly, the traditionalists during this period, from what I can see, they are not, they are not indigenous. <laughs> there is, you know, nowadays, maybe people think of Afghanistan as a place that has a lot of traditionalists in it. During this period, almost the entirety of the 20th century, there are very few traditionalists who are not backed by foreign powers, right? The foreign powers that are backing traditionalists are Saudi Arabia and the US. And well, in the first half, it's Britain and Saudi Arabia. In, which are, of course, Britain controls Saudi Arabia until 1919, um, and the U.S. as well. Um, and the U.S. ends up orchestrating what turns out to be an important part of the, of the end of the Soviet Union, 
uh, through drawing the Soviets into Afghanistan, right? Um, so for me, I grew up in the U.S., and it's important for me and, and for anyone who, who's heard that sort of version of history to know that what we were told was completely backwards. So I was told that the Soviets invaded Afghanistan as part of expanding their empire. Um, but the government that they were allegedly attacking in Kabul was largely the pro-Soviet PDPA, um, which had come to power in a military coup in 1978 and had been establishing, had been doing a number of reforms, right? Uh, but the head of the PDPA was also assassinated, as we'll get to in just a minute. So later on, we found from documents that have been declassified in the last 10 years, and especially because of documents made public by Julian Assange and WikiLeaks, it was actually the CIA that had a presence in Afghanistan since 1968. And they built up, I mean, we know that they built up the armed forces near the border, the so-called Mujahideen and so on, but they also were trying to infiltrate and maybe successfully infiltrated the Communist Party in Afghanistan and other forces. And so uh, when the leader, um, Th President Tariki, is assassinated, it seems pretty clear uh, that whoever assassinated him, now it seems clear uh, that, that whoever assassinated him was a CIA agent. Um, in any case, uh, in 1979, the Soviets do come in uh, and they take over uh, Kabul and they, they uh, uh, kill President Amin, who may have been the person who, it gets very confusing because we don't have all the records, but Amin is the successor to Tariki. Tariki was the, the, the communist who uh, started doing a whole lot of land reform, right? Um, and the, uh, the land reform, of course, is very unpopular with the U.S. and very unpopular with Afghan elites as well. So the CIA has a presence in Kabul. They are also organizing the landed aristocracy, the feudal powers, to rise up against uh, the Tariki government as well. So this is the old uh, CIA script. It's not something new, something they do in Latin America all the time as well, okay? Um, so again, to, to use the peace studies framework, we have the inheritors of the British, the, Soviet, uh, the United States, waging a proxy war with the Soviet Union through Afghanistan. And we know from the declassified files and what Brzezinski said, so this is the Secretary of State, President Carter, uh, he said very clearly that he planted a trap and the Soviet Union fell for it by invading Afghanistan, right, or by coming in, right? And of course, when I say invading, it's complicated because it was clear that the U.S. was supporting the forces that are now the Mujahideen right by the border of the Soviet Union. So um, they felt that they were about to be attacked and not without reason. Um, so this is a violent regime change agenda with the U.S. on the side of entrenched elite landlords and mobilizing religious fundamentalists to fight a war on behalf of the feudal status quo. Before we go any further, I'd just like to return to one of uh, Gal Tung's um, slides, right? So as I mentioned, there's the latent level of conflict and there's the manifest level, right? Um, and so... What would, uh, what would Galtung say about all this? Right? In the first Afghan war, the Afghans are the victors, but the British extol a horrible price for the victory. Right? In the second Afghan war, the British are the victors, but they restore the political status quo when they leave. Right? So they put, they put the heir of the king that they deposed, they put him on the throne after the second Afghan war. The third Afghan war has no real victors, but maybe the British feel that they were a bit worse off than before. The British at that time, to be honest, I mean, they're fighting, um, the situation in India is bad. They're, they're fighting with Ireland. So there's a lot going on uh, at the time of the Third Afghan War. So I don't think the British uh, cared too much about Afghanistan at that time. Um, the conflict, the U.S. conflict with the Soviet Union, again, has no winner per se. Um, but the Soviet Union, because it no longer exists, and this is part of the reason that it no longer exists, uh, perhaps that is the loser. Um, after the fall of the Soviet Union, the Mujahideen, so the U.S.-backed forces, and eventually the Taliban. The Taliban are really the, the younger generation. So the Taliban are generally people who, men, almost exclusively men, who were raised on the battlefield. They have no memory of communism. They have no memory of sort of the modern uh, period in Afghanistan. Um, they were raised by sort of Saudi clerics on battlefields, right? Um, so the Mujahideen and the Taliban, when they come to power, they're forces that wouldn't exist without the U.S. and Saudi backing of the traditionalists. Right? 
In all of these conflicts, f conflicts, far more Afghans died than did the British or the Americans or even the Russians, right? So if you're an Afghan person looking at all this, what would you say? You'd say that the British, the Americans, the Europeans, more generally perhaps, are willing to play with Afghan lives for their own purposes. They have no respect for human life. They care only about power and control and taking land away from the Afghan people, right? So do you think that assertion would have been justified if an Afghan person were to say that in, say, 1999? Yeah. Okay, so with that, uh, we go to the events of September 11th, 2001. Here's a question. Let me see. Someone has said something in the, in the um, chat. Uh, thank you, Professor Islam, for, uh, for your congratulations. Here's a question for everyone. Um, how many of the 9-11 hijackers were from Afghanistan? Would anyone like to take a guess? Feel free to use the chat function. Don't look it up on Google, please. Just have a quick guess. No? Sabihaji, Mayankji, anyone want to take a guess? Mayank, you can unmute yourself if you like. No? Uh, actually, I, can, I have no idea about this, so I can't guess. Yeah. Okay. The answer is, is zero, right? So there is, out of 19, um, not a single one, correct, Sabihaji. Um, out of 19 people, not one... So 19 people who hijacked planes and tried to attack various U.S. installations, not one was an Afghan national. 15 out of 19 were citizens of Saudi Arabia. Two were from the UAE, right? So that's Dubai and, and um, Abu Dhabi and so on. One was from Lebanon, one was from Egypt, right? So despite that, a few months after the 9-11 attacks, the U.S. invades Afghanistan allegedly because Osama bin Laden uh, who, as CNN now admits, was probably not directly involved in the, attack, in the attacks. Uh, he was allegedly in, in Afghanistan, right? He did claim responsibility, but of course he may have had his own reasons for doing so. Right? So, uh, Galtung in speeches given soon after the attack, so I'm talking about the end of 2001, the beginning of 2002, he asked the question, you remember the, 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 the pyramid, the triangle? N violence actions, violent actions have meanings. All actions have meanings, right? So we have three planes flying into buildings at great cost of human life. And of course, the lives of the attackers themselves, right? So one must be very committed to do something like that, to give up one's life or something, right? And what are they, so that's the first thing they're showing is that they're very committed to this. What are the, the second thing they're showing is what is their, what are they attacking? In the case of the World Trade Center, they are attacking a symbol of U.S. economic power. And in the case of the Pentagon, they're attacking a symbol of U.S. military power. Of course, in the case of the Pentagon, it's more than a symbol. It actually is, at that time, it was the primary location, I would argue, of U.S. military power, meaning that the people who were making decisions about where the U.S. military was going to go and so on were physically located in that building, right? So it's a very clear uh, uh, statement, right? So, um, Someone, there's a question about who's speaking. So Galtung says it's the whole of the Islamic wor world. I think that's a bit of a stretch, right? Because, you know, uh, okay. But, but let's say there's some elements within the, the Muslim world who are making a very pointed statement, attacking U.S. economic and U.S. military power. Someone is accusing the U.S. of being a bully, an imperialist, um, and perhaps of only doing things when it can extract economic value. Now, when the U.S. sees that and within six weeks they go to Afghanistan with, by the way, plans for a natural gas pipeline, the so-called TAPI pipeline. This is Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India pipeline in the back pocket, right? When they do that and they try to, so they're trying to make money as they're, as they're exercising their military might, you are confirming the accusations, the allegations of your accusers, and you are increasing the likelihood of long-term conflict. You are decreasing the chances of a last any kind of peace. Okay. So uh, some of us, most of us may be old enough to remember that, but some of us are not old enough to remember that time. So let me just remind you 
of how that invasion was carried out. Um, we had the Northern Alliance. So these are, um, so, so let me just say why the U.S. decided to invade Afghanistan is a bit unclear. Um, you know, they, they wanted someone to blame and they, they blaming Obama, uh, bin Laden seemed like a, a convenient uh, scapegoat. Um, but many of you will remember that there were forces in the U.S. even at that time that wanted to go straight to Iraq, that thought there was unfinished U.S. business in Iraq. Um, but of course, Iraq would have had nothing to do with that. Saddam Hussein's uh, regime was not at all tolerant of these kind of Islamist forces, right? Um, so anyway, as I say, it's not clear that bin Laden had anything to do with the, the attacks themselves. Furthermore, the Afghan government, the Taliban, had offered to hand over bin Laden on the condition that they receive any proof, right? Um, so since the U.S., you know, it's, I don't know what kind of a crime it is to, to say that, you know, we need proof before we can hand over a suspect, um, the U.S. didn't accept that condition and they decided to invade, right? In order to invade, they had to unite forces that were very disparate, very separated. Mostly these were anti-Taliban mujahideen, uh, combined with some of the more brutal elements of the pro-Soviet regime. So during the, the Soviet invasion time, there was, um, you know, there were purges. There were attempts to sort of um, cleanse the country of, uh, of these kind of forces. Um, and so there were some very brutal, um, again, warlords who were aligned with the Soviets. So you found those warlords and you made alliances between the Islamists and the, the communists, or what's left of the communists. Um, and it, it was a very short-lived alliance. Um, they were, the only thing that united them was that they didn't like the Taliban, right? Um, but after that finishes, right? So after you had a successful invasion, you've, you've got rid of a certain party. What do you then do then? Right? Because you can't put, I mean, this is the United States that fought with these um, Soviet forces for so long. They're not going to put those in power. Um, nor could it put the Mujahideen forces, which are basically the same as the Taliban. They're as Islamist and as fundamentalist as the Taliban. Uh, so those are the people who gave you the country, but you can't put them back in power. So what the U.S. does is it finds pro-U.S. technocratic leaders who had zero popular support at all, right? people who have alliances with the World Bank, people who, um, you know, are sort of middle of the road um, economic people. I shouldn't say middle of the road. These are very dangerous people. We, they end up creating the 20th most, most corrupt country in the world. Uh, it's just people who are out there for their own personal gain, but are not beholden to any uh, constituency within Afghanistan. Uh, so, and then at the same time, of course, we haven't even touched about the long list of U.S. war crimes committed both in Afghanistan and elsewhere in places like Guantanamo Bay in Cuba, a uh, U.S. colony that it has no right to, but that it, it keeps an illegal prison there, right? The war crimes that were broadcast on televisions around the world, they contribute to the per perception that the U.S. is a bully, that the U.S. is anti-Muslim, that the U.S. is an illegitimate ruler and had very little understanding of the dynamics of Afghanistan. And when it tried to set up democratic processes, those processes turned out to be a, sh a sham, right? The threat of the Taliban, the armed resistance of the Taliban, never really went away during the 20-year occupation. Uh, by the way, the 20-year occupation is much longer than the occupations carried out by the British during the, the First and Second Wars. It's even longer than the period of, of uh, Soviet versus U.S. proxy war in Afghanistan, right? And I think it's important to say that the U.S. was able to cajole and coerce many members of the Afghan political uh, life who had been skeptical of the U.S. invasion uh, to at least come to the table and be part of the process. But because of the nature of the war and the occupation, they could never do what Galtung had suggested that they do back in 2001, 2002, which is to invite the Taliban to the table as well, right? So what Galtung suggested was, you know, any legitimate government in post-invasion Afghanistan cannot be a Taliban government, cannot be 100% Taliban government, as this is, I'm quoting him, but also cannot be 0% Taliban government. Because to the extent that there is a legitimate ruler in Afghanistan, it is the Taliban. And he would say they didn't, they weren't all bad. They did things like making the drug trade illegal and so on. Um, so they, they should at least be brought to the table and be negotiated with. But that was never able to happen. So because they, and it, partly because they never took any part in that, they, they were free of the taint that came along with being part of the U.S. invasion, right? So ultimately, the Taliban become the only legitimate resistance force to 
to an illegal occupation. So in that sense, perhaps what we've seen in the past few weeks and months with the Taliban takeover was inevitable, right? So I thought I'd end uh, with this kind of summary uh, slide. It's a tweet from my friend and professor Justin Podor, based in um, Canada. And uh, he summed, so he's summarizing what I've just gone through like this. So we have an 80 year period of imperialist de-development. I think it's very important to say that colonialism always includes deindustrialization, de-development, right? And, and uh, destroying of, of the country, right? We have a 10 year period of nationalist modernizing, which I haven't really gone into. From 1929 to 1933, we have a, a short period um, of Nadir Khan, who was a traditionalist uh, and seen as a British agent, right? He was basically, he was supported by Britain. Um, and then you have imperialism, uh, so that's the imperialism again. Then you have 60 years of different forms of nationalism, including Soviet-backed nationalism. And then you have uh, 30 years of an imperialist de-development, right? What I like about his typology is um, he's putting the Taliban and the Mujahideen into the external fold, right? The, he doesn't see a difference because, again, the Taliban wouldn't have existed without, without the U.S. So it's not possible to sell, separate the period of ta Taliban rule from the period of direct U.S. rule. It's all part of the same, right? Um, and, of course, no one knows uh, what will come next. So I'd like to end... Um, the presentation with um, with some thoughts and some questions. Um, this is again the, the what I explained in the beginning. So A wins or B wins, and this is the line of compromise and sort of win-win, right? Transcending this conflict. Um, so who are the winners and who are the losers? It's not clear to me that the U.S. counts as a loser, or if it does, it's irrelevant. Like it, that's not that's not the issue. The forces that were aligned with the U.S., which included what I would describe as a pretty broad center, so the center left, the center right, they are discredited. This means that the center left parties, the center right parties, you know, are, are not really viable options at this moment in time because they were tainted with the U.S. occupation. Some of the more radical groups, like the Revolutionary Association of the Women of Afghanistan or Rawa, remain untainted, but they are very small minorities. In terms of ethnicity, the U.S. occupation has served to aggravate ethnic divisions. So the Taliban have always had a stronger base in the Pashto areas of Afghanistan and in Pakistan. Right? Um, there are some elements within Pakistan and Afghanistan that feel that Pashto-speaking areas were, were treated unfairly by the Durant line. So this is the line that creates the modern border between Afghanistan and Pakistan and the old border between Afghanistan and British India. Right. Um, so those elements feel that there should be a unified Pashtu, Pashtu country, so they're Pashtu nationalists, or at least a province within another country. And it's, it's worthwhile to say that there are many, many, many more Pashtu-speaking people in Pakistan than there are in Afghanistan. Right? Um, so just to end some questions that I hope will uh, form the basis for discussion. Uh, the first question is, what has the U.S. gained with this 20-year intervention? So it's claimed that it's part of the war on terror, but of course that term is nonsensical. Uh, there's no, you can't have a war against terror. War is terror, right? Um, and if we look in terms of incidents of so-called terrorist activity, those have only increased uh, as a result of this occupation and similar occupations, right? So if it's a war, it's been a failure. Um, in February of 2018, construction finally did begin on the Afghan side of the Tapi gas pipeline, right? So that's again, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India pipeline. But of course, the construction has been going at a very slow pace because the war has been continuing. Um, second, you know, what did the so the first question is, what did the U U.S. Uh, gain? The second question is, what did the average Afghan person gain? And for me, I don't necessarily think that, um, uh, you know, when, when I'm asking about an average person, I, I don't want us to envision a sort of privileged uh, middle class urban person. Right. If we take the most vulnerable person in Afghanistan, for example, a rural member of the Hazara Shia minority, you know, they may have a few goats, uh, she may have children, she doesn't have a bank account, she doesn't have much savings. What has she gained uh, by this intervention? Um, in the case of the specific person that I'm thinking of now, she may have gained a lot, right? She may have gained time. 20 years is a long time. Um, and while the U.S. didn't do her any favors, I mean, we shouldn't have any illusions about that, uh, they didn't care about the fact that she was from a small minority. The Hazara community is very small. They didn't care about the fact that she was Shia, right? 
They didn't care if she worked a job or tended the fields or if she chose to work in her home to take care of her family. The U.S. didn't care about that kind of stuff and the, the forces that were aligned with them didn't care about all that. Um, but that was not the case. You know, in 1998, 1997, when the Taliban was in control, there were much stricter controls on what she could or couldn't do. And it may be the case now going forward, it's early to tell, but it may be the case that those stricter controls again will come up, right? And the persecution of minorities and Shia and so on again will be the norm. So maybe she has gained a, a very, something very important time. Not all communities would be able to say that, of course, but in the specific example that I'm giving, uh, that may be the case. Third, and perhaps most important, in war always, the problem is not with the losers. Of course, the losers, you know, it's, it's sad that you have loss of life and, and, you know, no one likes to be defeated. But the problem is really with the victors. The victors have learned the lesson that violence pays, right? That violence is the solution, right? And now the question becomes, who will teach them a lesson, right? Um, so the, the question is, you know, will the Taliban have more sense than the Americans and allow for some kind of pluralistic future within which uh, many different parties can have a seat at the table? There can be a sort of a debate about the future of Afghan society um, along more political and economic lines. So with that, uh, thanks very much, um, and I'm looking forward to uh, any questions you might have. You can type them in the chat. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you so much, uh, Samir. If there are any questions, please go ahead and either put them in the chat box or I can turn your mic on and you can speak. Uh, when we end the program, if anybody has something to say, please do say. Uh, Dr. Bhagat has joined us from Washington, D.C., and he's particularly uh, interested in peace issues. Uh, we have known him for so long. If he has something to say, uh, we will be very happy to hear. Uh, Sabiha Ji has her hand on, uh, up. Uh, Sabiha Ji, we are very happy to hear from you. I'm letting you, uh, I'm just allowing you to speak through this button. Please do go ahead. Um, right now? Sabiha Ji? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right now, can I ask or can I, shall I wait for Dr. Bhagat to finish and then I will ask? Hello, am I audible? No, please, please go ahead. We can hear you fine. Yeah, can, yeah. You can ask Hi, your Samir. It was it was a very wonderful uh, lesson, and uh, just to tell you, I joined a course in uh, peace education through Indo Turkish Foundation uh, for about a year, and there also in uh, in my syllabus we had learned about John Galton, and it was a very lovely thing to learn. My whole, uh, you know, the question is that how funny it is. When there was not a single Afghan citizen, uh, you know, a party to what happened to U.S. and it was really very bad. It was really very, very, very inhuman to kill somebody like that. Why is it that today also the Afghani people are paying the price? Have you seen the latest videos of Afghanistan? My heart goes out for those kids who are there in the hospital who don't have medicine, for the women who are out of the school, for the young boys who are out of jobs. I don't know what to do. Whenever I pray in my dua, I always say, Allah, why they have to face this? I don't know why. What have you to say about, why is it that we just like finished Afghanistan, almost all of us together, not only US, we also as, 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 as the other party to it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sabi Haji. I, I uh, you know, I don't have much to say. War is, is nonsensical and um, always uh, innocents are the ones to pay the price. I think it's important to say that this war, as you mentioned, was completely unnecessary, was fought under false pretexts and has involved pioneering some of the most dangerous weapons that, that humans have seen. I mean, the, the kind of tonnage that's involved in some of these bombs which are justified because they say the terrain in Afghanistan is very rocky, et cetera, et cetera. 
I mean, they can kill a whole lot of people and they have killed a whole lot of people. And of course, when one looks not just now, but for the past 20 plus years, the U.S. has a habit of bombing wedding parties and funeral parties. I mean, it's, it's the, the level of war crimes is really um, quite atrocious. And I take your point that it's not just the U.S. We all are to blame. Uh, but I, I do think there are, there are uh, there is a class, there is an elite class, which has a lot more to gain from these wars than common people who just want to, to get along. So, uh, so thank you for that, Sabiaji. Samir, there is a question on YouTube, uh, which is by Sunita Garg. What do you think the UN can do now? The situation is so bad in Afghanistan. Surely the UN has to do more than provide hum humanitarian aid. Yeah, it's a difficult question because the UN itself is also very compromised, you know, and I, I don't know that, um, you know, I, I don't know that we have faith in the UN to do the right thing, to be honest. I mean, it, you know, what, what should be done by some party is some kind of a, a mediation process where you get the various um, people around the table and have a discussion. Because at the end, you know, when we talk about the Taliban or some of these forces, it ends up being the same kind of discussion that we're having elsewhere uh, in peace vigil around the Hindutva forces in India and so on. You know, these are um, these are not people who accept the pluralistic framework, right? And until they can be sort of convinced to do that, convinced to respect other people's opinions, that's only when conversation becomes possible, right? So that's what what's needed is someone to sort of say, okay, look, can we all sit down? Can we, you know, what is it that you want? What is it that you need? You know, can we move towards free and fair elections at some point? This is a discussion that needs to happen. Um, but, you know, now we're talking about two or three generations, right? So, so 1980 to 2000, 20 years as a generation, 20, 2000 to 2020, two generations at least. And when we're talking about a war-torn war country, People are having children much earlier. People are also dying much earlier. So maybe three or four generations since the 1970s, people don't remember that. People don't remember that there was a pluralistic ethos within Afghanistan. So you have to find a way to rebuild that. And it is not going to be easy, but I think it is possible. And of course, the UN could play a constructive role. Um, unfortunately, I don't have much faith that it will. Um, there may be other countries, you know, there may be, so, you know, uh, Sabi Haji mentioned that Tur Turkey was playing some kind of a mediator role in, in some of these conflicts. It's done that well. There are other countries that have played that mediator role very well. Bhutan has played the mediator role sometimes interest in interesting ways. So uh, Nepal has a history of uh, state building not too long ago. Um, so there, there is sort of region, regional South Asian experience that could be brought uh, to assist uh, in the sort of creation of a, of a pluralistic ethos within Afghanistan. But of course, the current leaders have to actually want that and have to, they have to want to put down their guns. And so far, to be honest, I mean, it's been mixed. I, I won't say that it's been all gloom and doom. There have been signs that the Taliban may be open to that kind of an approach. So, uh... If there are not uh, any more questions, we would like to conclude the program with a few points. The first is that we have to remember uh, that the United Nations, uh, as I said in the beginning as well, that it was formed to prevent future wars and have a more peaceful world. Uh, the United Nations, as we know, is constituted of pretty much every country in the world except uh, for uh, the, uh, the Vatican, I think, and uh, Palestine. Uh, but otherwise, every country in the world is part of the UN, which means that the populations of these countries have to put pressure on their governments not to go to war and not to support wars. What ends up happening is that the governments are able to convince their populations that it is important that we go to war. It is essential that we go to war. Uh, there's a reason why we are going to war. And as we have seen time and again, those reasons are generally false. Uh, those reasons are generally 
not met with facts they are just ways to get the populations to agree to go to war as uh, as uh, as uh, a step towards taking revenge uh, so we must in wherever we are prevent our countries from getting involved in wars and in this uh, you know i am reminded of a quote of gandhi ji um, and i'll share that with you and it was on one of our posters as well and he said was not war itself a crime against god and humanity and therefore were not all those who sanctioned which includes the populations engineered of course you know the politicians and the war mongers and conducted wars war criminals so when you know people get all puffed up and say i am going to war to defend my country it's really uh, not uh of of any use to that person in fact it's detrimental to that person and his and her family and the people who are gaining from the war don't get killed so we have to remember these things from uh, from what we can do as individuals and families and communities that of course there is the united nations but united nations is really of no use unless the people who form the countries that forms the united nations are very much against war and don't let it happen as sami said only time will tell you know if there were any gains and things um but uh, uh, but i will say that you know what really clicked with me that sami said is that it's not a war on terror war is terror so let us remember that how can how can we finish other wars with another war it's just not going to happen sabi haji you are you are right uh, you know uh, the, all these commissions during the first world war and things and the, the war propaganda that happens i will just uh, you know say two more things before we end one is that um, whatever peace we talk about it has to be sustainable so what johan galton constantly talks about and he has talked about it from the beginning when he started to talk about conflict resolution is that peace has to be sustainable you know just like we talk of environmental uh, stuff you know we say that you know sustainable development the same applies to peace you cannot come and apply peace in a land and then like have no idea how it's going to continue so peace has to be sustainable we have to find ways by which it lasts the second thing is that it's a process it's not an end in itself peace is always a process and has to continue whether it is in our country somebody else's country or all over the world it's a process so it's very important that 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 process keeps happening it's not something that you know we attend a workshop today or a webinar today and you know we suddenly have peace <laughs> it doesn't work like that and of course we have to involve the local people in whatever we are doing we cannot come as outsiders and just expect everybody to believe in what we are doing especially given the history in afghanistan as sami so nicely laid out in front of us the whole history that there is already a sense of uh, you know distrust there is a, a whole history of violence uh, including uh, you know killings and rapes and um, and a lot uh, like lot worse like making people starve to death so i think with that we can uh, conclude that our aim on the international day of peace uh, is really to understand peace more by understanding what are the hurdles to it so understanding things like war and the cycles of violence and that once we understand that we will be better equipped to defend peace to promote and protect peace i would request all our listeners uh, on youtube and on zoom to please subscribe to the peace vigil channel on youtube if you have not done so already it's very easy you just go to youtube and write peace vigil and there's an i you know our logo that appears we have over 150 videos there that you can gain from please do tell your friends and relatives also to subscribe also go to facebook we don't pay a lot of attention to our facebook page but if you can like us there it will be helpful uh, and do join our little group called good things happen too 
where we discuss issues uh, uh, about how we can promote and protect peace and how we can help each other. Peace Vigil uh, uh, sends you again warm greetings on the day of peace. And we invite you to our next program, which is on 2nd October, which is Mahatma Gandhi's birthday. We will, uh, it will be a very small group of people that day, but we uh, ask everybody who joins our workshops and programs, if they can join, please do. It will be a small group of people talking about their experience with Peace Vigil, and they will be sharing some poetry and prose. And it will be followed by a wonderful speech by Dr. Vipin Tripathi, who is a, a great soldier of peace. He has been promoting and protecting peace in India for the last several decades. He's a true Gandhian uh, and uh, his life is also a message for us, just like Gandhiji's was. So I will see you there on the 2nd of October. Do read the newsletter where you will have all the information. Do join us on Good Things Happen Too and subscribe to our channel and like us on Facebook. And I bid you all a very good evening or afternoon or morning, wherever you are. Peace be with all of you. Peace be with all of us.